Hello, Gateway Church Life Groups. We are finishing our fall series together, 10 weeks together, journeying in God's Word in our various groups. I want to thank all of our life group leaders, those of you that have been leading in discussion and prayer each week. Uh, you are a vital part of our discipleship pathway and process here at our church by leading these groups. So thank you very, very much. And for those of you that have been participating or hosting these uh, different gatherings or who have just started going even in the last uh, three, few, three or four weeks and are, are, are just starting now to grow and understand the value that's found in being in community with others. Uh, I want to thank you as well. I hope uh, that as we take a break a little bit here now, getting ready for Thanksgiving season and then Christmas season, uh, that you will uh, get refreshed, re-energized, and join back in with your group or a new group coming up in, in the new year. So be, be mindful of this, and I hope you'll take advantage. Uh, where as well, I have one more message in our series here as we're closing out this fall on The Bible Doesn't Say That. Uh, this past Sunday, we, we closed out our series together. I, I wanted to make sure I added this one more. I, I thought last week was going to be the last one in the series, but this one more important one came to mind. And in fact, the importance of this is because this might be one of the most misunderstood things that we use. In fact, this is probably the most misunderstood phrase that is applied in keeping us from understanding the real truth and the story of God and the gospel. And it's this idea that being good is good enough. Many of us live this life with kind of this scale in mind that, you know, if I do enough good and it weighs out the bad, that, that in the end God will see that and that will be the reason why he accepts me. That my own ability and energy to do good things are the reason why God will welcome me to his presence. And for those of us that have maybe even been around church a long time or read the Bible or, or have even uh, spent time in conversation with others uh, about the story of God, we may believe this, that, you know, we want to be a good person. In fact, maybe when you've shared with others what you believe about God and the gospel, they say, yeah, well, you know, I am a good person. And they start to list out all the ways in which they are good. You know, hey, I'm good. I, I go to church. I even go to Gateway Church. I, I tithe. We talked about that last week. Uh, I try to not gossip behind the scenes of people. Uh, I've been to uh, uh, baptized as a child or baptized as an adult. That, that, that goodness, that's a good mark in my life. That, that I've done all of these things that externally God must recognize and say, ah, that's good enough. But you know, that could be the greatest barrier for us truly understanding the gospel himself, itself. And you know what? Our goodness then only becomes as good as the people we're comparing ourselves to. As we think, okay, is, am I being good enough? You may look out in the world and you may say, oh, well, I am not part of a terrorist organization that's killing others. I'm not uh, part of a, a evil uh, violence that I see in the world. I have not done anything uh, as, as wrong and, and violent and extreme as that. I must be good. Or you may even personalize it more so, maybe not on a global extreme comparison scale, but you may say, hey, listen, I see my brother, I see uh, my friend, uh, I, I, I see my colleague, I see my parents, and what they said and did or acted, I'm better than that. I haven't done what they've done. And so our goodness is only as good as the people that we compare ourselves to. And you know, for many of us, our a perceived sense of our goodness is our greatest barrier to God. It can be our greatest barrier to truly understanding the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. As we talked about Sunday, being good is not good enough. There was a story we used as an illustration to begin in Luke chapter 18. Remember, it's the ruler, often called the rich young ruler. And he says this in verse 18 of Luke chapter 18. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone, and you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. I have kept all these from my youth, the young man said, the rich young ruler. When Jesus heard this, he told him, You still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And after he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. I want you to notice what Jesus is saying in this text. He's saying to this rich young ruler, your allegiance to the rules and regulations and laws of the past are not enough. 
You may have been able to obey that Mosaic law, that conditional covenant that was given, and it may on the outside show that you're good compared to others around you. But Jesus wants more from him. Jesus encourages him that the only way to truly have eternal life is to sell all he has and follow Jesus. Now, what is Jesus saying? Is Jesus saying that all of us must live uh, completely uh, without any financial resources or means at all? No. Is Jesus saying that all of us need to give everything we currently have to the poor? No. What Jesus is saying is that for this rich young ruler, the idol in his life that kept him from complete allegiance was his riches. And God said he needed to cast that away in order to show his complete dependence on God, his trust, his faith in God. And so people said, man, uh, in the verses that follow, gee, who could practice this kind of life? And, and, And Peter reminds him, Lord, we've left everything for that. Who can be saved? It was said prior. And Jesus replies, what's impossible as man is possible with God. In other words, God says to be good enough, we need more than just moral allegiance to rules and regulations, that God desires our trust and faith and reliance not on the things we could do or our hope and riches and the things of this world, but our trust, our confidence, our salvation needs to be placed elsewhere. You see, what we see the Bible teaches is that grace is enough. Because Jesus was good, so we can devote ourselves to goodness in response. I want you to see that. Being good is not good enough. Grace is enough. Because Jesus was good, so we can devote ourselves to good things. I want you to see that in a couple verses here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and following. It says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. These works, these external trappings of religious devotion to a law and a system and a covenant and to externally demonstrating that I have things together, God says these are not enough. It's by grace. Grace is enough because Jesus was good. Jesus lived that perfect law and died as our perfect sacrifice. And then in verse 10, I want you to notice what it says in Ephesians 2. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So, good works are part of the equation after we have received that grace and trust in God. You see, grace is enough because Jesus has been good, so we can devote ourselves to good works. You see how that works? None of us will ever be good enough to receive God's favor and his forgiveness. But God's grace is enough because Jesus was good and died in our place and rose again so that we could follow him and respond. You see, our good works, the workmanship, the poem that God is writing in our life, as it says in Ephesians 2, verse 10, is in response to what we have already received by grace of God through faith in the goodness of Jesus. That's the salvation message. That's the good news message. That I recognize my goodness is never good enough, but that Jesus has been good enough. And I could trust in him. And it doesn't end there. It's not that you just believe it and it's a mental ascent to something that happened a long time ago. It's an ongoing allegiance and obedience in response to the goodness of God. Another verse that teaches the same is Titus chapter 3, verses 6 and 8. Listen to this, or, or, or really chapter uh, verse 4 and following. It says, When the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Christ our Savior. So that having justified by his grace, there it is, we become heirs of the hope of eternal life. And this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God, remember, those who have received that grace of God based on the work that Jesus has done, but those that believe in God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good 
and profitable for everyone. Do you see it again? God's grace is enough because Jesus is good. So we can devote ourselves to the good, to the good, to the good. Grace is enough. Jesus is good. So devote yourself to what is right. So two questions here as we end. And I want you to discuss these in your circles. Have you accepted God's grace? Have you accepted that grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ, who lived the life we could not live and died the death that we deserve, who has risen again as a hope and a promise that he's coming again? Have you trusted? Have you, have you admitted your need before your Savior, that you're a sinner that falls short? Have you placed and trust in Jesus as your only salvation? And as a result, are you committed to following him? This is salvation. This is the good news that Christ has lived, died, and risen again for you and for me. That's God's grace that is good and enough because Jesus was good. And for those of you that have never done that, I pray today might be that day. In fact, in your circles, talk about it. That there, there's an understanding, this moment when I recognize where I were, was, and what Jesus has done, and I want to trust in him. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's salvation. If you have received that, ask yourself this question in response. Am I now doing good that demonstrates my love and allegiance to the one who has done the ultimate good for me? Am I living a life of good works, not so that I can in some way think this makes God accept me because we know being good is never good enough, but because God was good and God's grace is there, am I living a life that demonstrates to the world around me my allegiance to Jesus as Lord and as Savior in my life? Have I trusted in him? Do I believe in him? And I pray that for us as followers of Jesus that we might do so. You know, we took communion on Sunday. It's an outward sign of this inward work that God has done in our life through Jesus. It's this demonstration and opportunity to love and know and experience God's grace afresh. And some of us that have been following Jesus for a long time think now, God, i got to prove back to you that, I, that I'm worthy. No, none of us are worthy. He, he loves us. He cares for us. He's pursued us. And as we take these communion elements, we remind ourselves, Lord, because of what you showed me, I want to follow you. I'm going to recommit myself to you. So, have you received God's grace? If not, let today be that day. Because being good is never good enough. Like that rich young ruler, you can't be obedient enough unless your whole heart is dependent and reliant on what God has done. And if you have, is your life demonstrated? Does the goodness that you're pursuing come out of a response to God's goodness for us? If not, we need to repent Ask for forgiveness and seek to do good in word and in deed to those around us. Well, once again, thank you this fall for joining us in our life groups and through our series here, especially talking about what the Bible doesn't say. I hope that you will go deeper in your understanding of God's word, that you'll not just accept cliches and phrases as divine, you know, inspired truth, but that you'll truly dig deeper to understand what God wants and has for us. Now, as you break up in your circles, Encourage each other, ask those questions, dig deep, and trust God together. God bless you.